All right, guys, so here is, uh, here's part two uh, about body paragraphs. So we talked about introductions, and let's go over some information about body paragraphs. Again, uh, make sure that you um, listen up to the end of the video because I will tell you what I need you to do for next time. Um, and there's some good information here as well, some information you might not have realized about body paragraphs that I want you to focus on. Okay. So here's the deal with uh, body paragraphs, right? Body paragraphs have this specific function, right? They need to convey the main ideas of your argument, all right? And of your analysis. And you wanna think about how you organize these body paragraphs, right? They need to, need to be presented in a logical order. Um, sometimes people approach things chronologically. They talk about what happened at the beginning of the story, then in the middle of the story, then the end of the story. So they arrange them kind of, they arrange their paragraphs kind of, kind of chronologically. Um, sometimes people will um, wait to save the most difficult concept until the end or the most abstract concept until the end. Um, it doesn't really matter what you do, but there does need to be a logical um, function uh, or logical um, order to your, to your body paragraphs, okay? Um, so, Let's talk about the body parts, right? So, what are what are the what are the parts of a body paragraph? Just like there was parts of the introductions, what are the parts of body paragraphs, right? Well, the first one is a topic sentence. You got to have a topic sentence. Uh, the second thing you have to have a context, right? So, what is the context of this paragraph? Give us maybe a little bit of background information on it. And then the second thing, or the, excuse me, the third thing is evidence with analysis, which you guys have done quite a bit with uh, with these. Uh, with these small discussions we've been doing on D2L, you guys have really worked with incorporating evidence with analysis. So we're not going to spend a lot of time going over that part because you guys are uh, pretty well versed in that already. All right. Um, so let's talk about topic sentences for a second. Topic sentences have two functions, right? The first, the first function is it serves as kind of an introduction to the paragraph, right? And when you introduce um, your when you introduce your paragraph, right, that topic sentence will hopefully kind of reinforce a key idea in the thesis statement. All right. Now, there's a really good indicator of a really good topic sentence, right? What's the mark of a good topic sentence? And I cannot stress this to you enough, right? I'm going to read this verbatim because it's so important, right? A good topic sentence will clearly relate to the thesis statement. The reader should not have to read the entire paragraph to determine how a topic sentence fits the thesis statement. All right, and let me show you what I mean by that, okay? So if we were to take this, my thesis statement right here, Miller clearly illustrates that in times of panic, his, times, of, uh, times of panic and hysteria, excuse the typo there, people are led to do acts of intolerance and injustice. If one is looking for the true culprit, look no further than hysteria. So if I'm, excuse me for just a second, so if I am um, exploring this, oh, excuse me, I'm tricky. So if I'm exploring um, this idea of topic sentences directly relating to my thesis statement, let's look at these three topic sentences as actual topic sentences within my essay, right? So I have hysteria is defined as mass panic, John Proctor's affair with Abigail compromises the Proctor's reputation, and three, Reverend Paris capitalized on the fear of people in his congregation to promote the spread of witchcraft. So if this is my thesis statement up here, which is about panic and hysteria and so on and so forth, and then these are my three topic sentences for my three body paragraphs in my paper, which one of them do you think doesn't belong, right? Which one of these things like does not directly tie into this, okay? If you guess number two, you'd be correct, right? The first one, right, we can see how hysteria is defined as mass panic. I, I mentioned hysteria in my thesis statement, so we can see how that's going to work. The third one, right, is talking about Reverend Paris capitalizing on the idea of fear to promote the spread of witchcraft. And we can see how that would work, too, with, uh, with that thesis statement. But the second one, there's no mention of John Proctor. There's no mention of Abigail or reputation or anything like that. So the second one really doesn't fit. Now, I'm not saying that this second sentence is a bad sentence. I'm not saying it doesn't work. But in the context of this thesis statement, as a topic sentence, these two, two, these two things do not go together. All right? So maybe this is a good sentence in a paragraph, but it doesn't really function well as a topic sentence. So we want to make sure that we really put the, put the thesis statement next to every single one of our topic sentences, and there should be a direct connection or link between the two. Okay? 
Um, the second thing is the context, right? Which this is similar to the context of your um, introduction when we talk about it, when we talk about it there. But the context just kind of serves as a guide for the topic sentence. It sets up the parameters for the topic sentence and the rest of the paragraph in a similar way that the context of your introduction kind of set up the rest of the introduction. But it just kind of helps us understand the main idea of the paragraph, and it usually occurs immediately following the topic sentence. So take a look at, oh, and the last thing is evidence and interpretation, right? We've talked about this, though, before, and you guys are getting really good at this. You have to have evidence. Evidence is, evidence is key to supporting your thesis statement, but evidence is useless unless you have adequate interpretation, all right? So um, you want to make sure that you, uh, you want to make sure that you include both evidence and interpretation. So let's take a look at a sample paragraph here. Um, and I know I'm kind of in the way. Let me see if I can kind of. All right, that's about as best I can do. But uh, this presentation's on D2L, so you can see uh, you can see what it looks like. But um, so you see that you see the you see the paragraph right here, right? Let's go ahead and highlight the body parts that we we're talking about. So right here is my topic sentence. Hysteria is defined as mass panic. There's my topic sentence right there. But then I have the context for the topic sentence. So I'm kind of I'm kind of defining and what means am I going to talk about this idea of hysteria, right? So because panic is a fear-based emotion, Arthur Miller is clearly illustrating what people are driven to do in times of fear. So it's kind of talking about how um, uh, characters in the play might have used fear as a motivating factor to get people to do certain acts, right? And then I have this. This is seen in Act 3 when Danforth states, comma, there's my quote, right? And I give the famous line from Judge Danforth that we talked about. But notice, I want you to be really careful. I want you to make note of this. Notice how long my quote is versus how long my analysis is, right? My analysis is much lengthier. It takes up much more of the paragraph than uh, the quote, okay? So you need to do kind of some quote to analysis ratio uh, examination, right? And if your quote is twice as long, three times as long, or maybe even equally as long as your analysis, you're not writing enough, okay? I think I might have mentioned this to you guys um, before, but a good... Uh, a piece of advice I got from a professor in college, which I really, really liked, was that um, for every sentence of for every for, for every sentence that you quote um, an author or a writer or whatever, you should write six times that amount. Now I'm not going to make you write six times that amount. I don't even think I did that here, but. I do want you to kind of think about, you know, am I writing just as much as the author? Because if I'm writing just as much as the author, then I'm not writing enough. So I want you guys to shoot for maybe for every one sentence you have of an author's writing, you have maybe two to three sentences of your own writing, all right? And really try to make this paper your writing, not someone else's, because I don't need to read The Crucible again. I need to read your writing, okay? So here is what, let me see, I'm going to move myself again. Here's what needs to happen for next time, all right? So what you need to do and what I need to do. So what you need to do is have your intro paragraph and two body paragraphs completed, all right? You must have an attempted thesis statement, and you must have at least two successfully integrated quotations from the text, all right? Again, I cannot stress this enough. If you really like what you used from some of those Blackboard discussions, right? And you want to expand on some of those ideas that you created in that Blackboard discussion, you want to use that, you're fully welcome to use that. So go back and look at that information again. See, like, man, that's that's good stuff. I can really, I can really use that. Um, and you need to bring questions to class about anything that was covered um, in this video or the introduction video. So if you have any questions about, you know, thesis statements or topic sentences or introductions or body paragraphs, or whatever, you need to make sure you bring those questions with you to class so we can go over those, okay? What I will do is I will give you a specific, um, I'll give you an assignment handout that has specific requirements for this assignment and due date, so you'll find out when this essay is due and um, re uh, just requirements along the way. I will uh, give you a scoring guide, scoring rubric as well, so you can see how you'll be scored for this. And then I will also allot time for individual writing conferences. You guys are, uh, when, we get, when I see you guys again on Thursday or Friday, depending on when it may be, um, I will have for you uh, time to do some peer editing. You'll get in small peer editing groups. And we'll talk about the roles of peer editing and so on and so forth, but you guys will have time to do some peer editing 
while you're doing that, I will allot some time to talk with you individually to see if you're encountering any challenges, if you have any points of, if you want me to look at anything, just kind of discuss what's going well, what are you struggling with, what can we improve on, so on and so forth, okay? So that needs to be done for next time. You have this stuff. I will have all of this stuff. And uh, together we will uh, we'll be just fine. So have a good day. Thanks for your cooperation. Thanks for your participation. I look forward to uh, uh, reading your writing and going through this writing process together. And um, I'll catch you later. All right. See ya.